Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of KCAB International and Friends webinar series. My name is Sally O and I'm a case counsel at KCAB International. I'm pleased to be able to greet you all and introduce you to today's seminar which has been co-hosted with 39 Ethics Chambers and Yulchun Law Firm. The topic that we'll be discussed today is advocating advocacy and in international arbitration for non-native English speakers, focusing particularly on effective oral and written advocacy and effective cross-examination. We will be hearing the views from both Korean practitioners and international arbitrators on this topic. To enlighten us with the arbitrator's point of view, we have Mr. Stephen Lim from 39 Ethics Chambers. Stephen is a leading international arbitrator and advocate, recognized internationally for his extensive experience of more than 25 years handling commercial arbitrations and disputes involving the Asia Pacific jurisdictions. He sits as, an, as a panel arbitrator in multiple arbitration institutions such as SIAC, HKIC, and also KCAB, where I've had the privilege of working with him on a case not so long ago. To provide us with the insight of Korean practitioners, we have our friends from Yulchon, Ms. Junghae Sophie Ahn and Ms. Hyona Park. Founded in 1997, Yulchon is one of the top international corporate law firms headquartered in Seoul. With its high standards of excellence and effective solutions, Yulchon has been recognized by both our domestic and international legal community as the most effective law firm in Korea. Sophie and Hyona are both partners of Yulchon's international dispute resolution team. So on behalf of KCAB International, I would like to express our, our, our appreciation and gratitude for the speakers today who have taken their time to share with us their professional experience and views. Now, before we start the discussion, I would like to invite Ms. Suhyun Lim, the Secretary General of KCAB International, to give her welcome remarks. So when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Sally. Thank you for that. And good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. I would first like to start off by thanking you all for joining us despite your busy schedules and the wonderful spring weather outside. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by KSAVE International, Yulchun LLC and 39 Excess Chambers. We'll talk about the interesting but sometimes elusive subject of advocacy in international arbitration for non-native English speakers. International arbitration continues to be increasingly popular among users in Korea. Looking back in the past 10 or 15 years into the growth of arbitration in Korea, it has been amazing to watch how quickly and thoroughly the legal community has learned and mastered the skill set of international arbitration. Now, not only do lawyers, but also their clients know how to use arbitration. They also have learned to take full advantage of arbitration. However, international arbitration still remains sometimes a purpose complexing and unfamiliar subject for a vast majority of potential users in Korea, mostly for two reasons. First, the procedural rules and mechanisms are different from domestic litigation. Users who approach international arbitration with a litigation mindset will understandably feel uncomfortable with the modified forms of pleadings and evidence-taking mechanisms, which originate from the common law jurisdictions. And second, if that was not enough, there is always the language barrier. For an overwhelming majority of Korean speakers, mastering English or any other foreign language has been an arduous and lifelong endeavor. The discomfort and dissatisfaction that, may, that some may feel from the inadequacy of their lingu skill, linguistic skills is something that makes international arbitration more difficult to approach. This discomfort felt is even greater if someone is considered eloquent and articulate in their mother tongue. In that case, the discrepancy that one feels between the ease of their own mother tongue versus the frustration of a foreign language is even greater. KCAB International, as the sole arbitral institution in Korea uh, for international users, 
have, has always been committed to providing education and training services that bridge the cultural and linguistic gap that Korean users of arbitrations may feel. We have continuously provided knowledge sharing events, publications, and initiatives. We continue to reach out to potential users to enhance their knowledge and familiarity with the best practices of arbitration. Advocacy is not just a matter of mastery over foreign language. It is about understanding the mental workings behind the minds of international counsel and arbitrators alike. Advocacy is a delicate art that needs to be addressed from a wide array of legal, cultural, and even psychological aspects. For this, we are immensely grateful for our friends at Yulchon LLP and 39 Excess Street of Chambers to make their time and share their thoughts and experiences that we hope will provide users very useful tips on what type of advocacy is useful, efficient, or not in international arbitration. The topic of advocacy in English for non-native English speakers is a broad one, and I expect that there will be a lot of content packed into this session. I hope you all gain something from this session, and without further ado, I will hand over the floor back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for your wonderful remarks. We will now proceed with today's discussion. Please note that after each topic, we will have a short Q&A session. So please feel free to make use of the question chat box to submit any questions you may have for the panel. So I would like to now pass over the screen to Stephen. Thank you very much, Sally, for, for the introduction. So thank you very much also, Sue, for, for your opening words uh, to this topic and this webinar. Uh, so let me just quickly outline what we're going to try and do uh, within this hour. There isn't much time. I mean, certainly, you know, this cannot be a comprehensive course in advocacy, uh, both oral and written and also cross-examination in international arbitration. One hour is, is not enough. What we're going to focus on is what is, is good advocacy and why we think, well, certainly I think, uh, it is possible for non-native English speakers to engage in advocacy in international arbitration in English. Now, wh why do I say that? Now, first of all, I, I have to recognize that, uh, you know, I, I am, I, I'm a Singaporean English barrister, also qualified at the Singapore Bar, whose, whose native language is really English, even though uh, Singapore considers my mother tongue to be Mandarin, but uh, I grew up speaking English at home, went to school in English, took Mandarin as a second language, went to university in England, qualified at the bar in England, so you know, I really can't claim to be a non-native speaker uh, of English. But uh, I do practice uh, exclusively in Asia. I've practiced in Asia all the more than 25 years I've been in practice. And Increasingly, in the last uh, two to three years, I've been sitting more and more as arbitrator uh, than appearing as counsel. And I have many different firms that appear before me uh, who are not uh, you know, the usual international firms. There are firms from Korea, from Vietnam, from China. Uh, and increasingly, they are doing their own advocacy. And, and I realize you know, from that that it is possible for someone who's not a non-native English speaker to be effective in advocacy in, in international arbitration. So I'm gonna start off first of all by, by talking for about the next um, nine minutes, uh, well, 10 minutes or so about oral and written advocacy and what I think is effective oral and, and written advocacy. Um, what I will tell you about oral and written advocacy uh, is not going to be what is effective oral and written advocacy for non-native speakers is going to be what is effective written and oral advocacy, period. But what I'm going to say about it, I think, is achievable by non-native speakers. Uh, and why do I say that? Because the, the first thing, the first cardinal principles of both written and oral advocacy is, is clarity and simplicity. That's what all arbitrators are looking for. We're looking, no matter how complex the actual legal issues are, how complex the case is, what we're looking for is, is someone, an advocate, who will, who will explain to us in as clear and simple terms as possible 
what their case is and why we should find uh, in their favor. In my own practice, uh, as, as an advocate or even as an arbitrator now, uh, is still to, to engage uh, in, in, in writing as clearly and, and simply as possible. Uh, and in fact, to make the points that I want to make, you know, whether as a counsel or as an arbitrator, as concisely as possible, to make it as brief as possible to make the point that I need to make. Uh, as someone who is, who is long-winded uh, and takes a long time to make his point is not going to be as effective as somebody who gets to the point straight away. So have said that, you know, even though you may not be as fluent in English as a, as a native speaker, even though you may, you may stumble a little bit, uh, you know, if what your aim is, is simplicity and clarity, then I don't think you have that much of a disadvantage over a native speaker. Now, I, I don't want to, to make it sound that it's all easier than it actually is, because even as someone, you know, for myself, who I, I say I am a native speaker of English, to achieve that clarity and simplicity, in, and simplicity is not easy. <laughs> and I don't want to make it sound that it is. I mean, when you, when you present clearly and simply, you are presenting very simply, but to get there takes a lot of effort. Uh, and it's the same whether you are a native speaker or non-native speaker, because what you're trying to do is, is to distill the most complex case, whether on the facts or on the law, into the most simple propositions that you can make them. That's what you want to do in, in, in advocacy, whether written or oral. You're trying to break down what is the most complex case into the most simple propositions that you can make them so that it is easy for the tribunal to understand the points that you're going to make. And it's probably at this point, perhaps, that it's worth for me to, to, to quote something to you that I came across quite recently. Um, and it's actually you know, not, not a legal text. Uh, but but comes from the world of fiction, and more particularly, actually, the Japanese author Haruki Marukami, who who you know I enjoy a lot. Obviously, not in Japanese, but in English, uh, and I find his novels very interesting, you know, and also very engaging, and easy to read. Uh, and I came across something recently that really struck me, which I thought was quite apt for me to raise in the context of today's discussion, which is. Uh, his discussion of how he began to write. Uh, and I didn't realize this, but when, when he began to write, when he first wanted to become a writer, even though English is not his, his um, native language, and as far as I know, I think he, he still mostly writes in Japanese. And, and when I read his, his work in English, it is in translation. But he first started to write, according to Marukami himself, in English. And let me read to you what he said. He said, Needless to say, my ability in English composition didn't amount to much. My vocabulary was severely limited, as was my command of English syntax. I could only write in simple, short sentences. That meant that, however complex and numerous the thoughts running around my head might be, I couldn't even attempt to set them down as they came to me. The language had to be simple, my ideas expressed in an easy to understand way, the descriptions stripped of all extraneous fact, the form made compact, and everything arranged to fit a container of limited size. The result was the rough, uncultivated kind of prose. As I struggled to express myself in that fashion, however, step by step, the distinctive rhythm began to take shape. And the reason I, uh, I wanted to, to quote that to you is, is because here we have someone you know, who, who is trying to express himself in English. And in this case, you know, Marukami did it out of choice. He didn't do it because he was trying to write in English. He did it because he was trying to write better. And he thought he would write better if he forced himself to write in English. And some of the things he said are exactly the sort of things that we want to try and achieve as advocates to achieve that sort of clarity and simplicity that I spoke about at the start, which is one that you have many complex and numerous thoughts running in around in your head in the case. Everyone does, you know, even 
I do when I'm dealing with the case. There'll always be many complex and numerous thoughts, different strands that you've tried to pull together. Uh, and it would be a mistake for you, for anyone, whether a native speaker or a non-native speaker, to just put that down in a sort of stream of consciousness, all the different strands, just put, put it down on a piece of paper. That would be a huge mistake. You've got to try and organize it, first of all. And, and what Marukami said about expressing his ideas in an easy to understand way with descriptions stripped of all extraneous fat. And that really strikes me because ultimately, and I do the same when, when, I, when I write my written submissions, my, my awards, or, or when I present oral advocacies, I try and, and strip what I say of everything that is extraneous. As I said, I try and be as concise as possible. I try and and distill what I need to say to the exact point what, that I want to bring across to the tribunal. And the simpler and shorter that I can make it, the better. And as Maru Kamet say, the form was made compact. And that's what you're really trying to achieve. And everything arranged to fit within a container of limited size, which again, I think is a great metaphor because nobody wants to read long briefs. If you can write a shorter brief, which concisely and accurately brings all the points that you want to make out, I think you'll be a far more, you'll be a far more successful advocate. So I wanted to raise that because, you know, I thought hopefully that might give encouragement and inspiration to those of you who are non-native speakers, that it is achievable. In fact, perhaps, well, at least in the case of Marukami, you know, he became a better writer because he forced himself to write in English in his non-native language. He found, as he said, a distinctive rhythm. Uh, he found that you know, what the voice that he wanted to achieve you know, came out of, of, of that exercise. So it, it certainly may not necessarily be a handicap that English is not your native language. Now, uh, let me, before I, I run out of time, also talk to you about why I think language may not be necessarily a handicap when it comes to clear clarity and simplicity, both in, both in your, your written advocacy and your oral advocacy. Uh, and that's because, and this is something that's come to me fairly recently. Um, and for me as well, even though you know, I've been working at this, honing my craft as an advocate in, in my, my written advocacy and my oral advocacy for more than 25 years, I'm still learning. Uh, and recently I, I began to read a book that, that didn't have a, a particularly engaging title, but it, it was written, it, the title is Thinking Like a Writer, A Lawyer's Guide to Effective Writing and Editing. Uh, and it's written uh, for an American audience, but I found it incredibly helpful because it distills what you need to try and get in terms of clarity uh, into certain ways in which you should organize your work. So it's not necessarily about the language you use. I mean, it, that plays into it somewhat, but it's really, what are certain principles that you need to keep in mind about communicating with, with what you have to what you want to say. And this is all about more about how you organize your words and your thoughts rather than the express language used. Now I know I'm really running out of time. So let me just quickly run through what some of these principles are. The first principle is that readers absorb information best if they understand the significance as they as they see it. Therefore, before you inundate a reader with a, with a tremendous amount of detail, give them a context of framework that helps them grasp the details relevance and the organization that binds them together. So bring, this brings me to the point, what you really need to do before you start putting all the mass of information that you may want to put down is you need to distill into it. What is the key point? In every case, no matter how complex, you can probably work it down to less than 10 key points, ideally five key points or less. These are the key points that you want to bring across. This is what your whole case is about. And you need to really work very hard at distilling your case into those key points. And then from there, develop it. But you set out that structure right up front. So when the tribunal reads your work, they know, they, know, they see that that's what your case is all about. That means in providing a focus and making the structure of your, of your case explicit right from the beginning. Now, the other point is that readers absorb information best if the form and, and, and its structure and sequence mirrors the substance and sequence of the, the plot of a story, the theme of an argument. So again, this is more about organization. It's not so much about the language you use. Uh, 
Now, I better wrap up because I don't want to eat too much into Sophie uh, and, and Huna's uh, time because they're, they're going to provide a counterpoint to what I'm going to say. I think that should be very interesting. But the other point is readers absorb information best as they absorb it in pieces. So you need to break up the information you're, you're, you are presenting into bite-sized pieces. Again, and this is why if you can distill your case into four or five key points, then you know these are the bite-sized points that you need to keep coming back to and, and bringing out. Um, and the final point is readers will pay more attention if you approach their material from their perspective, not yours. And of course, so if you're addressing an arbitrator, you've got to bear in mind, what, it is, what is it that he's interested in? He, he wants to know how to decide this case. And you, you need to organize your submissions from that perspective. Now, I haven't said too much about oral advocacy, but I think what I've said about written advocacy applies pretty much to oral advocacy. Uh, and just to make that, that point, I'll just finish off with, with, with what I was gonna say, which is that another quote that I had, which is speech, is the best form of communication which most nearly expresses thought. And that's what you need. You want to convey your ideas across as an advocate. And therefore, the written word should be designed to sound like speech. So really, you should write as if you are speaking. And that is the most effective advocacy. And therefore, as I said, what I've said about written advocacy would apply just as much to, to oral advocacy. But let me pause here because Sophie and Huna are going to react to what I say and, and tell me whether you know, I have been unrealistic about what is achievable for a non-native speaker. So let me hand this over now to both Sophie and Huna. Thank you, Stephen, for your wonderful presentation. Well, first of all, I fully agree with your point. Well, uh, as I introduced, I am Chung Sophie An, and I am a member of the International Dispute Resolution Team of Yulchon, and I'm mostly involved in international arbitration. And in most cases, the language of arbitration is, of course, English. And to address my language background, I am a Korean native speaker, and I studied in the US when I was 30 something. And so English is not a language I'm familiar with. So when I first started my career as an international arbitration practitioner, I tried hard to be fluent in English, as fluent as native speakers. But after several years, I found it is impossible and even useless to be as fluent as native speakers. I found that it is not the language that really matters in advocacy. As Stephen said, Good advocacy should be clear, simple, concise, and brief, and well-structured. Then how can a counsel does clear, concise, simple, brief, and well-structured advocacy? From my experience, preparation is everything to the effective advocacy. The preparation should start at the very early stage of arbitration, even before we start advocacy. When we learn initial facts and see the key documents, we need to start preparation of advocacy. In other words, before we use our oral and written advocacy skills, we need to establish a strategy. We need to have a big picture. We need to have a map to follow before we start advocacy. With this preparation, we can write down most complex cases into clear and simple terms, as Steve mentioned. And the important thing is that preparation is what everyone can do. Whether we are native English, native English speakers or not, we can and we should fully prepare our case. That's the point. From my experience, it is not impossible for native Korean speakers to be better prepared than native English speakers. And when we are well prepared, it is not difficult to do advocacy clear, simple, concise, and well structured. In some aspects, it is easier for non English native speakers. As Stephen mentioned, uh, Professor Marukami's example, well, as to clarity, it is easier for non English native speakers. For them, it is more difficult to say long and complex sentences with slight and subtle nuance. In other words, non-English native speakers are already set up to do clear advocacy. And as to conciseness or simplicity, it is even easier 
Most people become relatively less talkative when they speak foreign language. So it is easy for non-English native speakers to state only the key points. It is relatively difficult for non-native English speakers to small talk or to fluently mention less relevant facts and theories. Again, we non-native English speakers are set up to do concise and simple advocacy. And as to the structure, it's really not relevant to language. So the important point is that you should be familiar with the case, not the language. And uh, several years ago, I experienced an arbitration case where Yulchun was retained as the lead counsel of a European company. And our co-counsel were English lawyers. The main reason was because the governing law was the Korean law. And in other words, we were in the position to better understand the relevant legal theories. And at that time, all the lawyers from Yulchun's side were Korean lawyers and none of us has lived or studied in English speaking countries when we were young. But after we were retained, I was mostly in charge of written advocacy and my boss was solely in charge of oral advocacy. As we fully understood both the facts and legal theories, it was not very difficult to the advocacy and our English co-counsel were very happy with our advocacy. So uh, to sum up, in my view, Fluency is like flowers on the top of a cake. They look pretty, but they cannot make the cake more delicious. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sophie. I think it's my turn now. And um, uh, before I begin uh, my response, I uh, first would like to thank Stephen uh, for his very encouraging comments uh, for um, non-native speakers uh, such as myself. Uh, much like my colleague Sophie, my first language is um, also Korean and I'm only licensed to practice in Korea. So um, at the very beginning of my career, I felt um, language would be a challenge that I needed to um, overcome if I were to pursue my career in the um, international arbitration field. And I thought I should be more than fluent in order to fully advocate in an international arbitration case. So I've been practicing English uh, while working as a lawyer and hoping that I would be able to perform like a native speaker. So at first I was more focusing on speaking with the right accent or using the perfect expressions or even um, flowery languages. But then I realized that I was paying attention to um, the wrong things. I mean, no matter how hard I try, I will never be the same as the um, native speakers. I will just be um, pretending. So what really matters and what I should be focusing on is the substance of my argument for the case that I present before the tribunal. And I should be looking for a way to deliver my arguments to the tribunal in the most persuasive and effective way. And it's not just a matter of language skills. I also fully agree that uh, simplicity and clarity, Stephen mentioned, are key factors for good and effective advocacy for both written submissions and oral pleadings. And I think this applies regardless of your language or legal background. But um, in reality, the only reader of my written submissions and the only audience of my oral pleadings, I mean, other than the opponent counsel, would be the, um, the tribunal. And if the members of the tribunal are all English native speakers, and if they are not familiar with non-native speaking counsel, then I would still have some concerns and I might even consider having a native speaker take the leading role for that particular case. So um, I'll briefly share my concerns or challenges that I um, faced as a non-native speaker when preparing written submissions and um, oral advocacy in an international arbitration. So um, first for the written submissions, um, I, I couldn't agree more that um, simple and clear submissions are the most effective way to do the written submissions. I'm actually trying to be simple and clear when I'm doing the legal writing not only in English, but also in Korean. But um, in the real international arbitration cases, uh, sometimes I find it difficult to be concise in English, especially when it comes to legal analysis of the case. 
When summarizing background facts or relevant events, I didn't find language was a big huddle. However, when dealing with complicated legal issues, it can be challenging for a non-native speaker to be simple and concise. In many of the international arbitration cases that we actually deal with, it usually involves a several complex legal issues that cannot be explained in a simple way. And um, this may not be a matter of language skills, but um, if the governing law of the case is from common law system, then I would feel the lawyer from that jurisdiction should be in charge of uh, preparing the submission because the parties would normally appoint arbitrators from the same jurisdiction and the tribunal must be more familiar with certain writing style that's commonly used in that jurisdiction. So bottom line, I think it's important to understand the readers of your written submission which is a tribunal, and should also be able to prepare in a way that the tribunal would feel most comfortable with. And if the tribunal uh, are all um, native uh, English speakers and familiar with certain styles of uh, written submissions, and well, this may not be the, the usual case, but if the tribunal has little experience with non-native speaker as counsel, then I fear that um, written submissions prepared by a non-native speaker in a less familiar way might even have some weakness. And um, as for the oral advocacy, um, Korean practitioners who mainly do uh, domestic litigation may find it quite difficult to present the whole case before the tribunal orally because um, the Korean domestic litigation are normally conducted based upon the written submissions rather than oral pleadings. Uh, in fact, when I was trained to be a lawyer at the time, there was no specific curriculum for oral advocacy. So when I started my career as an um, international arbitration lawyer, I had to learn this oral advocacy through various programs provided by arbitration institutions and also from my secondment in one of the um, English barrister chambers. So it was certainly a big challenge to me uh, to do the um, oral pleadings in English. But I think at the same time, it made me prepare even more than I would do for the cases that are conducted in Korean. I mean, the more you prepare and know the case, the more confident you become. And at that point, I think the language will not be a matter anymore because you are already familiar with all the English vocabularies and expressions that have been used for that case. Mm -hmm. It's um, no doubt that non-native speakers need more time and efforts for the preparation than the native speakers. But I think it can also be uh, some advantages for the non-native speakers to achieve successful advocacy. So um, that's my response. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for the insightful discussion. Now, before we move on to the next topic, I believe we have time for a short follow-up discussion and Q&A session. Um, anyone with questions, this is a great time to ask our panel. But, um, or if the panel has any other further discussions to say. Um, if, there are no, if there are no questions, Stanley, I, I think I would like to react to what uh, Sophie and, and you and I have said. Uh, I, I agree with Sophie and, and also with you now that it's, it's not all about language. Becoming a good advocate is not trying to sound like an English QC. And that is not what advocacy uh, is about. Uh, look, you know, you know, let, let, let's place my own accent. People can't place my accent, you know. It's, it's not an English accent. <laughs> it's just, you know, people can't really kind of place it. People look at me, if, well, particularly if they don't see me, they'll think, you know, where is this guy from? I can't really place his accent. But it doesn't matter what the accent is. The point is, can I speak clearly enough that the person can understand me? Can I communicate the points that I need to bring across? And it's not all about language. And again, I thought the, the metaphor that, that, that Sophie ended with was a very apt one, you know, that you, you, you could speak in a lot of flowery, flowery language and the flowers may look very pretty on the cake, but ultimately what's in, what really interests the tribunal is what's inside that cake. You know, what are the ingredients making it up that, that makes up this case? That's what the tribunal is ultimately interested in, not how beautiful it looks. It is, what are the key substances? And really, if you, to some extent, uh, and you know, align, align with, with what I've been saying about simplicity, clarity, and also you know, what I've quoted from, from Marukami, you're trying to strip out everything uh, 
all the flowery bits, even your own thinking, you're trying to strip out in your own thinking, you know, all the non-essential bits to get the core of what is the issue, the point, the idea that you need to bring across. And you're not going to achieve that by trying to decorate it more. You're going to try to achieve that by, by stripping it to its naked essence. That's what you're trying to do. Uh, and therefore, in, in that sense, you know, you're, you just, you need to have a, a sufficient command of the language, of the vocabulary that you need to do. I mean, I'm not going to be foolhardy and say that, you know, if you don't have the basic com uh, command of the language, then you can do this. I mean, I've openly said, uh, I wouldn't try and advocate in Mandarin because I just simply don't have the vocabulary for it. I studied in Mandarin as a second language. I stopped studying it when I was 18 years old and I hardly use it anymore these days. And it will be completely foolhardy of me and unprofessional of me to try even try and say that I can advocate in Mandarin. But that's not the case you know, with, with people like Sophie and with Yuna, because you still use it every day in, in your work. And, and you, you take, you know, both Sophie and Yuna have, have taken university level courses in English. And if you've got that, then it's more than enough. Uh, and you don't then need, and you've got the basics. And I think that basics is enough. And the other point I want to pick up on is that one of the, the concerns that Puna raised about um, whether the tribunal has familiarity with non-native speaking counsel. Well, I think that's not something that it should be something that the tribunal should apologize for and not something that counsel should apologize for. Uh, the tribunal is, you know, needs to understand. It is the duty of the tribunal to understand what counsel is saying. You know, and it was, in effect, it is, it, it is a, it, to some extent, you know, a, a dereliction of a tribunal's duty if you don't make the effort to try and understand what 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 counsel is saying. Uh, and the other point I make about that, uh, and why also I I've spoken a lot about this about advocacy in international arbitration with non-native speakers is because, you know, I, I primarily, primarily practice in Asia. I'm an Asian arbitrator practicing in Asia. Increasingly, my work is, is certainly, I would say, 100% Asian in that it's got at least one Asian party and an Asian subject matter. And increasingly, you know, sometimes 90% of my cases have two Asian parties. And I have Asian parties from all over Asia, from India, from Korea, from Vietnam, from China. Uh, and it is my duty as, as, a tri as a tribunal member to make sure that I can understand what all of these counsel are saying from all of these different jurisdictions. Um, and well, the other thing I would say, if, if that is a concern still, is that then you appoint tribunals who are familiar with Asian work and familiar with non-Asian parties uh, who are appearing because you know, I think the, the balance of shifts has definitely shifted uh, and the predominance of, of, of cases, both in this part of the world, involving Asian parties, then the tribunal must be familiar with Asian parties appearing. Um, let me pause here and see whether Huna or, or Sophie have uh, anything to add. Oh, I think we actually have got two uh, two points that have been been raised. Yeah, we've got we've got comments from Anton and Tomorrow. Uh, which says that Cicero would agree, he said about 2,000 years ago, capture the matter, the words will follow. Uh, and I agree with that. If, you're, if your thoughts are clear, you will find a sufficient way to express it. Um, and yeah, I, I, I see uh, the reference to Brian Garner as well and, and, and legal writing in plain English, which, which I've read Garner's work. And one of the works that I've read as well is, is one by uh, Garner and Antonin Scalia, uh, but one thing I, I would say about that, and, and I don't want people to get discouraged about that, would be uh, when I read uh, Ant, as Brian Garner and Antonin Scalia's uh, work on, on it, it, advocacy, one of the things they began with was, you know, improve your English. And I don't want people to get put off by that because you might, to some extent, my, my, my thinking on that has shifted as well. I mean, I spent years... Um, working on my English, even though I'm a native speaker, I spent years working on my English, thinking that that was the key to, to writing more clearly uh, and, uh, and clearly and, and simply, but it's only part of it. Uh, and as I said, the other part of it is also about organizing your work and also about understanding how best to bring across your point to, to your audience. And that involves a little bit of understanding how people understand you 
and not so much about how you express what you want to say. You need to understand how people understand you and try and fit, organize what you say um, to that. But let's let's see whether Sophie or, or Huna have anything to add before we move on. If not, then I think it's now uh, for me, uh, Sally. Uh, yes, so we will now then move on to a second topic regarding effective cross-examination. And I believe um, right back to you again, Stephen. Thank you very much, Sally. So it's, it's back to me then to talk about cross-examination. Now, I know this is um, sometimes a perplexing and mystifying topic, particularly for uh, non-native speakers and uh, if, if you're a non-native speaker, you know, quite likely you come from the civil law world and not from the common law world. Uh, and I know that there isn't as much cross-examination. Well, it's not such a mystifying art. Um, there is a method to it, and which I will go into. <laughs> but before I, I do that, uh, and just as a, as a tie-in, because I wanted to tell the story as well, in, in connection with, with, my, with what I was talking about, written and oral advocacy, was just a story. <laughs> from um, a US Supreme Court judge, Justice William J. Brennan. Uh, and he told this story of himself. Um, he was a young criminal lawyer. Uh, he was appointed to defend a, a, a case of, of uh, <laughs> I think a fatal accident case. And there was a police officer who, who lived near his client, uh, the defendant, who he wanted to be a, a character witness and he agreed. Um, and so he put this police officer on the stand and he says at that time, I think he was just out of Harvard Law School. Uh, he hadn't had any training in advocacy. So he rose and he said, the first thing that he said was, sir, are you acquainted with the defendant's reputation for, ver for ver veracity in the vicinage where he resides? Uh, and the police officer uh, in, in this story said, was an elderly Irish cop. And he looked puzzled and then he said, uh, well, uh, I think he's a good driver, I'd say. So Brennan didn't quite get the answer he wanted, but he wasn't going to stop. Uh, and so he repeated the question word for word. And this time the witness just stared at him. Uh, and as he was trying to repeat his question for the third time, the judge stopped him. And the judge said, officer, do you know the young man over there? pointing to the defendant. And the, judge, the, the officer said, yes, your honor. Have you ever known him to lie? Well, no, your honor, was the answer. A and that was what it was all about. And the judge went on to say, well, that is what young Mr. Brennan has been asking you. But he went to Harvard Law School and has forgotten how to speak English. And I thought that was a good introduction to tie in to both and what I was trying to say earlier about really presenting simply and clearly, and that applies as much to your oral and written advocacy as to cross-examination. Um, and also then it's a good time to cross-examination because that, that, that example is taken from, from cross-examination. So what is, you know, what is this art about cross-examination? Well, some of the things that have been said um, earlier by, by Sophie and Huna uh, apply here as well. And one of the main things actually is preparation. Cross-examination is all about preparation. It is about knowing the case or at least the points that you want to put to the witness better than the witness does. And that's quite a challenge, especially if you're dealing with a fact witness, because the fact witness you would assume would know the facts better than you would. But well, you, you do have some advantages. One is you control that examination. You decide what you want to ask about. You know what areas you want to go across. And you can focus on those areas and learn as much as you can about those areas as you need to. And even though the witness may have been the person that was actually involved in those facts, well, you know, memory isn't as good uh, as, as we would all would like to think. And sometimes you don't really have a grasp of, remember quite clearly what happened. And there's actually, there's a, there's a recent uh, ICC commission report on 
on, on memory and, and fact witnesses. And you may want to read that. And the conclusion is that actually witnesses don't really remember as accurately uh, uh, as they think. As, as, as an example to this, I, I, a few years back, I had to cross-examine a, a witness. And the client wanted me to, I mean, to really shake this witness. Uh, I mean, that's a side point. I didn't really agree that that was what cross-examination is about. But they said, you got to do that. Uh, and I had to take this witness through a, se a sequence of events as to what happened, a sequence of correspondence. And I took this witness through this correspondence and it got to a point where um, the witness then said, oh, you know, um, at, you know, this is what we did after that. And I said, I know. And, and this is what you did after that. And I told the witness what happened. And I saw the witness eyes widen in surprise because the witness was surprised that I knew the case at well. But that's what you ideally try, you want to achieve. You want to know the case as well or better than the witness because that's going to give you the upper hand uh, in the cross-examination. So that's, that's the first thing, it's, it's preparation. The other thing um, about cross-examination is, is actually sometimes it's not so much a, about asking questions, but really putting points and facts of the witness that you want to put uh, and you want the witness to agree to. You may have heard this said that never ask a question in cross-examination that you don't know the answer to. And that, I think that is true 99% of the time. Sometimes you have to take a risk <laughs> and ask a question because it's a, it's a point that you, despite all the preparation in the world, you've not actually had the opportunity. You know, you, you, it's not a fact that simply is in the papers. So you don't know that, you don't know that fact. And sometimes you've got to take that. But most of the time, what you are doing in cross-examination is actually putting to the witness points that you know, and you know are true, that you know that you can back up with, with, with a document or some other evidence, so that if the witness doesn't agree to you, you can take the witness to that document or that evidence and say, well, look at this, what does it say? And do you now agree with the point that I'm making? So, you know, cross-examination in that sense is actually a misnomer. It's not, it's not questioning, but actually putting points um, to, to, to the witness. And the other thing about it actually is it's also methodical. At least that's the way I, I approach it. Cross-examination is a very methodical exercise. And let me, let me sort of just sh briefly show you an example. I think the best way for me to do that is if I show you what I mean by that. Let me share my screen. Uh, and what you should be seeing now are cross-examination notes. So I've, I've done a similar kind of, <laughs> of, of presentation um, for HK45 um, earlier this year. Uh, and as part of that, I had to do a mock cross-examination. And, and what I'm showing you is how I organize the notes uh, that I do that. Um, I, first of all, I organize it according to what is the issue? And it's coming back to the same points that we we're discussing before. What is your case about? What are the issues that you need to, to draw out in, in, to support that case in, in your cross-examination? Uh, and I organize the questions, as you can see, according to that, to what the, so in this case is the background, background and role in contract negotiations. And then, Photographs provided at the Houston meeting. So one of the critical things was, you know, the case involved um, one of the, well, the case turned around whether certain photograph, photographs, photographs proved um, uh, were, that were relied on by the other side um, proved that the, in this case, the defendant made a representation to the plaintiffs. So it was a critical point. And so I have a series of questions about that. And it's all organized, you see, methodically. And it also follows a certain logic. What I'm trying to, to do, what I did with this exercise, and I think, I think I've shown you enough to this, so let me stop sharing the screen and come back to what I did with this exercise and with any cross-examination is first of all, you start with your case. You start with what is, what is, what is my case? What are the points do I need to prove? What is the evidence that I have to prove these points? And you, usually the evidence, especially in international commercial cases, is going to be documentary. You're going to have documentary evidence uh, as to that. Uh, and then you, you would look at that and you say, what is the witness saying? And what does the witness say that doesn't agree with the case that I want, that I, that I want to put? 
And how can I show that what the witness says is not correct? And it is with these documents that you have. And that's what you actually go in to cross-examine a witness for. You cross-examine the witness because you have evidence to show that what the witness is saying is not correct, or at least to, to get the witness to agree with the evidence that you have. And it's usually evidence that they cannot disagree with. It's uncontrovertible because it is evidence that is in writing. And it usually is evidence that you know, it would involve correspondence about a past between the parties. So they can't really uh, deny that. And, and anything beyond that then might become a point of submission. But the key thing is you want, you want them to accept what is said uh, in, in those documents, particularly if what they've said in their witness statement and doesn't quite accord with that. So some other, some other points about um, cross-examination. One is, uh, and that was the example that, that I started up with of uh, Justice Brennan of the US Supreme Court was, was a good example of that, is that you want to put very short and simple questions to the witness. Don't start with a long uh, question and certainly don't use any big fancy words in there. You want the question to be as short and simple as possible, uh, you know, particularly as well since we're talking about uh, arbitration involving non-native speakers, is that then if you have arbitration involving non-native speakers, quite often as well, you may have witnesses who are non-native speakers. I mean, they may be giving evidence through a translator, or you know, they may be giving evidence in English, even though it's not their native language. But in that case as well, you want to make the question as simple and clear as possible. The one thing you don't want to do is to give the witness the wriggle room to say, I'm sorry, I don't understand you. Can you repeat your question? I mean, that's just going to cut your stride in the cross-examination. So you keep it clear and simple, keep it organized. Usually try and keep one question per point. So if you want to bring a point across, keep it and, and, and an example of that as well you when i read i read out the example to you from the examination uh, of that story told about uh, justice brennan he was trying to put too many points into his question he was trying to say you know do you know the witness and the witness uh, from from the area that you live in uh, and do you know what is his reputation uh, with regard to his honesty and there are really a few points in there, which is what the judge in, the, in that story broke up. First of all, do you know the witness? You know, and, and do you know, you know whether he's only told the truth? It's very simple points that you want to bring across. Um, the other point that you want to make is actually, you're usually putting a point to a, a witness and you're usually not asking a question. You're re usually putting a point. I mean, sometimes you have to ask a question, but usually you're putting a fact to a witness. Uh, and we don't have time to do the cross-examination exercises uh, in, in this case, because it's only an hour. But when I, when I did that, that cross-examination exercise and I did the mock cross-examination, what I was doing was more often putting points to the witness and getting the witness to agree with the points I was putting rather than asking a question. Because as I said, you know, one of the cardinal rules is never ask a question you don't know the answer to. So you already know the answer, you know the point, you know what you want to, to, to him to say, and you put the point to him, and you really then the answer that you require from him is either yes or no, you, he either agrees um, or he doesn't agree. Um, that, there's, there's a lot more um, I could say, but again, you know, I think there's, I'm, we're coming up against time and I think it'd be very interesting to hear what uh, Sophie and Huna has to say. So uh, I won't go on too long, but before I end, before I end, let me just uh, add this as well. And this is the perspective <laughs> from someone who, who sits on the tribunal, which is, I think the, the person who probably has the most sympathy of all in the hearing room is the witness. It is probably the hardest role uh, in that room, certainly harder than being on the tribunal, and I would say harder than being in counsel. And so tribunals will have a lot of sympathy for a witness, particularly if the witness is trying to be truthful uh, and helpful. Uh, it might be different if the witness is, is being intentionally obstructive. Uh, and therefore, and the point I want to leave, with you, leave you with is that uh, the, the best approach to cross-examination is to be polite um, and, and not be unduly harsh with a witness. Uh, sometimes some counsel think that their way to try and um, be effective is to raise their voice um, or to make snipe comments about witness, but all of that 
all of that usually you know, will backfire because the tribunal will not like it. It, it, it achieves no purpose. It is not going to get help the tribunal understand um, the witness evidence any better. Uh, and the tribunal just isn't going to like it because it will be seen as bullying uh, of the witness. And as I said, the one person that probably has the most sympathy in a hearing room is the witness. So, but let me end there and, uh, and listen to what Sophie and Hyuna have to say about the challenges of cross-examination for Korean advocates. Well, thank you, Stephen. I fully agree. I, I cannot agree more to your point that uh, cross-examination is all preparation. Well, actually, that's my point. Uh, like, like advocacy, the, cross, the preparation is everything for the uh, cross-examination, in my view. And it is possible for both native speakers and non-native speakers to prepare cross-examination. And non-native speakers can also know or understand the structure and the details of witness statements or expert reports, and the details of relevant facts and evidence supporting them. In preparation of cross-examination is not easy, but not because it requires very high level English, but because we have to deal with witnesses whose reaction is often unpredictable. So when preparing cross-examination, we should ask ourselves whether a specific question is necessary to cross-examine a specific witness and realistically what we can obtain from the question. This means that we can overcome the difficulties with preparation, with sufficient time and effort, not with language skills. Of course, as Hyona mentioned, uh, non-native speakers need more time and effort to prepare cross-examination or advocacy. But if we spend sufficient time and effort, we can fully and or better prepared. We cannot say that English native speakers are better in knowing the details or anticipated witnesses' reactions. So, and I don't think that witnesses will measure the fluency of the counsel and give different answers. And particularly when the witnesses are not native speakers, they cannot measure the fluency of the, the English of the counsel. They just give their answers. So good question, uh, the effective question, it's everything. And to return to what Stephen said, well, I try not to ask any questions. I do not know the answer of. We are not actually question or ask questions to the witnesses. We have to leave the, all the cross-examination procedure. So for example, I ask witnesses about the facts they mentioned in their witness statements. And if they deny the facts, then no more question is necessary. It will just discredit the witnesses. And if they stick to the facts, then I show them or I show the tribunal the evidence incompatible with their answers. It is not necessary to show that evidence just before the witnesses. We can do that in our post hearing brief. And in many cases, witnesses provide new information to make their answers look more truthful. And such information is often very useful or even valuable. And it is well usually more difficult to cross-examine expert witness because, uh, well, uh, how hard we learn the case, it is often very difficult to compete with the expert with their compete the expert with their expertise. Uh, we cannot let the experts explain their expertise. It will just give them an opportunity to talk about their expertise and it makes them more credible to the tribunal. So in fact, even if, well so um, in many cases when the expertise of an expert looks invulnerable, and then my strategy is to undermine the facts the expert assumes and the facts given by the other party's counsel. And as Stephen said, well, it seems that 
uh, most arbitrators prefer short and simple questions. And it is relatively easy for non-native speakers to use short and simple and clear language. As I mentioned about the, the advocacy, we non-English native speakers are set up for short and simple questions. And in my view, non-native speakers, especially we Korean lawyers, need to encourage ourselves. Often Korean lawyers give up an opportunity to cross-examine and give away the opportunity to English native speakers. And even worse, some Korean lawyers believe that English native speakers are better in cross-examination than non-native speakers. And many Korean lawyers do not even have opportunities for cross-examination. But again, in my view, the mother of successful cross-examination is preparation, not the language skill. Uh, and then I will, I will give the floor to Hyona. Um, thank you, Sophie. And I think I also have to thank Stephen for all those wonderful tips. <laughs> I think of uh, the points and practical tips um, Stephen um, kindly provided on how to do the um, effective cross-examination are also very um, valuable and helpful. And I've actually made um, notes out of um, all those points. <laughs> and I'm eager to actually use those um, tips, but not just in the um, international arbitration cases, but um, also in Korean domestic litigation. Um, I think cross-examination can uh, certainly be one of the most difficult tasks that um, litigation lawyers would encounter regardless of the um, language that they use. And I think it certainly needs uh, extensive um, experience and exercise to, to master the, um, the art of um, cross-examination. But um, even so, um, as a non-native speaker, I, I think cross-examination in an international arbitration might be easier in terms of language than having to uh, make your oral pleadings before the tribunal and sometimes having to answer very sharp uh, legal questions from the tribunal, given that you have already uh, mastered the skills for the um, cross-examination. Uh, I also I think it can even be beneficial if the witness speaks the same language as you do. For instance, you will get to hear the answer from the witness twice, like once in witness's own language and the second through the, um, the English translation. And I think this will give you more time to prepare your next move. And sometimes you can even deal with um, any translation issues that might arise uh, more effectively. And also being the non-native speaker, there is less risk of getting into an emotional fight uh, with English speaking witnesses. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, about the tribunal having sympathy towards the um, witnesses out of all the uh, participants in the um, hearing and that counsel should be polite. <laughs> uh, I actually had a case where um, I witnessed that uh, there was a slight tension between the arbitrator and a counsel because of the um, uh, aggressive uh, cross-examination examination of um, witness. Um, but that case was, um, the sole arbitrator was an um, English barrister and the uh, counsel for one party was, uh, from, uh, was a US attorney. And it, it may be my stereotype, but um, it seemed to me the US lawyer seemed a bit aggressive when he was performing cross-examination upon the effect witness. And I felt that the, um, the arbitrator from England suddenly did not appreciate um, such attitude. I I'm sure the arbitrator uh, was uh, trying to be independent and not to be influenced by um, such uh, cross-examination ma examination manner. But still, I thought uh, at that time, I thought it was probably some cultural difference between um, US lawyer and um, English barrister. But um, after hearing Stephen's comments uh, regarding tribunal sympathy towards the witness, uh, I, I um, think to myself that I should also be <laughs> uh, polite to any potential uh, witnesses in the um, future cases. But um, again, I think 
as for the cross-examination, language may be less of a problem as long as you are fully prepared for the case and you know all the facts and the materials, including the um, witness statements, far better than the witness. I think language should not be a problem, but I know that being fully prepared and knowing all the facts uh, far better than the witness can be more of a huddle than the um, language barrier itself. So that's my um, comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for the wonderful discussion. Uh, we will now have another short uh, Q&A session because we do have one question from um, Manjanatha Hiral, hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, when questions are a matter of fact or record, confronting, confronting the witness with the same and getting a yes or no answer, how is it going to be of significance apart to apart apart from seeking to draw adverse inference? Uh, could uh, we get an answer from anyone for that? Uh, well, I think I am the one who should answer this question because I mentioned that during my presentation to uh, bring my comment or response to Stephen. Uh, well, uh, confronting the witness with the same and getting an answer yes and no, and how is it going to be of significance apart to seeking to draw out adverse inference? Well, that's we should do that with our preparation. When we are well prepared, we know that there are uh, well, it, uh, there are evidence incompatible with what witness stated in their statements. So we passed, we answer the question not to get the answer from the witness, but to make them state something incompatible with the evidence. So in with that, we can draw adverse inference. That's my answer. Thank you. Can I can I add add on to that, um, Sally? Because um, th there is there is another reason why you may want to put matters on fact and record. Um, but that I think somewhat comes out of a quirk of, of English court practice, common law court practice, which is that sometimes the judge may not really have the full grasp of, the, of all the facts of the case. I mean, the, the way the, the uh, trial is organized in, in the common law world is that the judge really doesn't have the full detail of the case. And the full detail of the case comes out as part of the examination of witnesses. And that's why examination of witnesses uh, has such a, uh, you know, plays such a large role in, in, in English trials. But that, I really question the extent to which that applies in international arbitration. Because international arbitration, and you know, this is veering off topic slightly, this is a different topic uh, that you might find me you know, talking about, but the question, uh, this issue of the actual use of witness statements in, in international arbitration and the use of cross-examination in international arbitration, it is not the same as what you might see in the common law courts, because the procedure for international arbitration is different. Uh, and one of the things that you would expect the tribunal to, 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 to do is be fully on top of the case by the time they come for the hearing. I mean, I mean, okay, it doesn't happen all the time, but what should happen is that the tribunal should be fully on top of the record. And if they're fully on top of the record, they would know most of, uh, most of, the, most of the material already because you've got extensive written submissions you have the witness statements in advance. They would have seen that. Um, they should know, you know, I would say by that time, probably 90% of the case, right? I mean, there may be that 10% sometimes that, that will come out in, in either um, oral submissions or you know, less so sometimes in, 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 in examination. But I mean, the point is, if, if you speak to my colleagues in my other English barristers, they would say that actually the, the point, some of the, the, one of the aims for them out of, of cross-examination is to help the judge understand the case. And that's why, you know, when I said what I do in, in cross-examination, I'm putting points to the witness. And usually the other objective of that is, this is these are the points I want, I want the, 
the tribunal or the judge to understand, to note, to note, because he may not have noted it already. But again, I said, no, that comes out of a quirk of, of English common law court practice. And I question the extent to which this is really applicable in international arbitration, but that probably is, is another debate and maybe another webinar. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for that response as well. Um, if there are any more questions or discussions the panel want to have, I think it's time for us to wrap up. So is that okay? Okay. Uh, um, thank you once again to all our speakers and attendees for joining us today. Uh, we hope you may leave with valuable insight. This webinar will be uploaded on KCAB International's YouTube channel. So please see our channel should you wish to revisit today's discussion or perhaps check out our other webinars of this series. I wish you all a safe and happy day and look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. Thank you all very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.